Uh, yeah, like Rachel said, I'm Hlynur Hallgrímsson. Uh, I'm a senior data scientist within the Office of Data Services, which is the centralized uh, data science team here in the city of Reykjavik. Uh, I used to be an economist, still I'm a chartered economist, but I've been uh, working as a data scientist since uh, 2016 and a data analyst before that. Uh, I joined uh, the city of Reykjavik data science team in March of 2020, which was, uh, you know, it was uh, a short welcome because the, the the second week uh, of my employment, uh, we all got sent home uh, due to COVID. So it's been uh, like a rather remote back and forth, uh, back and forth between remote and uh, just in the office since then. But uh, this data science team is new. It was created uh, in 2019, the end of 2019, and we're a small team. So uh, there's only six of us. And uh, although sometimes we do like data products from start to finish, other times uh, we are essentially brought in to help with projects uh, in other departments uh, within the city of Reykjavik. Uh, but essentially our clients are other departments within the city. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, swimming pools and uh, a fun data science project that uh, has to do with our swimming pools. So uh, Reykjavik is, uh, accounts for a lot of, uh, a large share rather, uh, of Iceland's population, or about 36%. So uh, the population of Iceland is 375,000 people, but in Reykjavik uh, there are 135,000. And if you count the like the whole capital region, uh, like the suburbs, which are other like uh, other municipalities, they are actually uh, like sixty four percent of all Icelanders, like the capital region. Uh, and we're pretty crazy about uh, our swimming pools. Uh, so this is going to be about a project that is uh, trying to. Trying to show people uh, how crowded each swimming pool is, but uh, it's also just about how things are hard in data science. And it's not like that, uh, you know, training the most perfect uh, machine learning model is hard. It's just like the project logistics and what we've come to call group intercommunication. That's uh, you know that's difficult sometimes. But uh, so we have uh, geothermal uh, resources in the form of hot water. So uh, we pump the water from the ground at 80 degrees Celsius. So the hot water in Iceland is like incredibly cheap, which is like the, one of the reasons why we have these pools. That they're actually, you know, reasonably, uh, they're not like this. Uh, super fancy thing. It's just everybody goes to a swimming pool. And uh, also, uh, throughout the 20th century, one of the five people in Iceland was uh, on average working in fishing. So, like a big part of, uh, you know, our, just our coming of age story uh, as people is going to mandatory swimming classes through first to 10th grade. And like, yeah, I, I note here that it's roughly 400 hours of mandatory swimming, which of course is like the, like the worst version of everything uh, is the mandatory version. And also uh, it's just cold and dark. So we like to get what little sunlight we can uh, in the hot tubs. And we also go there to gossip and talk politics and just socialize. So the idea behind this project is uh, telling people, uh, being able to convey to people which swimming pools are crowded and which ones are not. So uh, like since the swimming pools are really popular, uh, people have been contacting us and asking if there's any way to see, like, is there a website where you can see like how cr crowded these are? And uh, welfare workers have also expressed that interest uh, for clients that are like susceptible to sensory overload, 
So that would be also a cool feature once we implement this. But like a, a big thing was that a neighboring town, Hatnafirir, it's like all about municipality competition. They now offer a website uh, dashboard which shows you how crowded their two swimming pools are. Uh, but in their case, they have staff manually count the patrons, as far as I'm, I'm aware. But also during COVID, uh, swimming pool uh, availability was cut to 50% of normal capacity for certain periods. So when that uh, became clear, we realized, okay, this is something that we have to do, not just, you know, to, uh, it wasn't like uh, it went from being a, like a nice to have to something that we wanted to work on. So this is something that comes from the Department of Sports and Leisure within uh, the city of Reykjavik. And this is their pitch, but it's not a direct quote. So they say, okay, so we've updated the gates or the turnstiles at our swimming pools to modern electronic turnstiles. Uh, with these modern gates, we can now get information on how many people are at each swimming pool through an API or an application programming interface. And their question is, can you help us present this data uh, showing how crowded each pool is? So this is essentially, at that point, this is just like, um, a, honestly, just like uh, we figure it's a simple shiny app and uh, just a question of database. How are we going to present this? If like, if you can just access the data, it tells us the number of current visitors for each pool. Uh, so, uh, like I said, this is uh, a project that is spearheaded by the Department of Sport and Leisure. They come to the like the centralized data science team to ask for our help. But with regards to getting the data, this is of course uh, a little bit more complex because uh, Department of Sports and Leisure has to deal with the Icelandic partner to the manufacturer of the gates. Uh, and they are our contact, uh, your contact partner for the actual vendor, the gate manufacturer. Uh, and this is this is my train of thought, but still, it should be pretty straightforward once we get the data right. And the clown face there is put for emphasis. So at the start of the project, I envision this as a rather simple project. You read the data from uh, the API using the HTTR package. Of course, we're going to be doing some data cleaning using the tidy version per. So we'll visualize with ggplot. Uh, make that visualization interactive with ggraph probably, and then make that into a reactive Shiny app and deploy it to either shinyapps.io or our Studio Connect. And this of course is a tragic miscalculation on my part because uh, I'm assuming that, okay, the data might take uh, some time because of this, uh, you know, communication and uh, they are not like, yeah, it's um, it's hard to like make uh, another team in like a company twice removed from you care about your product as much as you do essentially. So they are not going to be uh, with the, like the internal fire that we have uh, for this project at the at the data science team. So with the five uh, five item list. I'm assuming a lot of things about the data and the API. And just before we get into the like the nitty gritty of it, uh, like simple things, like these projects can be time consuming because there are like difficult things or complex things, but also the simple things uh, necessarily aren't necessarily simple because uh, different groups have different priorities. We have other priorities during the during working on this the biggest was uh, the COVID dashboard that we uh, needed to put up and maintain uh, at the same time that we were like starting work on this and then there's uh, group intercommunication and uh, like forced communication protocols is is kind of maybe bad a bad choice of words but essentially it's like we need to talk to the Icelandic partner and they talk to the vendor because essentially like the Icelandic partner is uh, 
is the company that we buy the solution from. And then there's uh, lawyer stuff. When, when lawyers between uh, maybe the city of Reykjavik and the vendor start talking, you can, you know, things just slow down. So this is a timeline uh, and it's absolutely horrible if you look at it. So the like the first idea to like we should maybe do this uh, do this thing uh, is in February of 2020, and uh, there's like uh, this request for data sent out. Hey, uh, can we access this API? And you know, lots of emails back and forth, and let me show you the emails. So like. It's maybe just 20 emails from one uh, like thread of emails that I uh, had up, but uh, it's not accounting for like meetings and stuff like that. But then you uh, take a, you take into account like that uh, between March and June, we like we did not have our eyes on this particular ball because we were focusing on focusing on. Uh, putting up the COVID dashboard and uh, maintaining that and keeping that correct. But uh, during the summer, we start to push for more, uh, like, what about this data we asked? You know, you said this, can you maybe look into that? And uh, in September, uh, we come to the conclusion like, okay, you can get this data and here's how, you'd, here's how it would happen. But uh, according, you know, according to our lawyers, uh, According to our lawyers, you'd have to pay a fee to access this API. And then the lawyers from Sports and Leasers say, no, 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 according to our interpretation of this contract, we don't actually have to pay this fee you're talking about. So that get there. Uh, yeah, gets in the way. But uh, after Christmas, uh, things start rolling and we get the, get the data. But then we actually get the data. And this is, uh, this is Friday, last Friday. And if you look at uh, look at this chart, you can see that for five of the six uh, swimming pools in question, these are like strictly increasing. These aren't showing us like how many visitors are at each swimming pool. And it comes down to the fact that uh, for five of these six pools, like the hardware isn't able to count out. It only counts in. Uh, but for the sixth swimming pool, which you see there in the left bottom corner, uh, it also looks kind of weird, and we'll get into that in a bit. But essentially, you can see that it's not strictly increasing. So it turns out, uh, like I said, the gate hardware for these five pools uh, can only count visitors into the pool. So current visitors isn't current visitors. It's the cumulative sum of total visitors up to that point during the day. Or like at the point of time uh, where we sent the GET request to, to the API. Okay, there's more. If you look at Leo uh, Atomsleg, you like this looks rather normal at like it passes the first eyeball test. Like, okay, this, this looks like actual data. But it's actually super weird if you look at like the end of the day. There are no people leaving the swimming pool uh, like at the end of the day. So when the pool closes and half an hour after the pool closes, there are still around 175 people in the swimming pool, according to the counter. And we'll uh, get to that a bit later. But uh, essentially, from this API, uh, we don't know when the people leave. We know when people uh, come into the swimming pool, provided we are querying the API. Uh, so we ask ourselves, what if we model the duration of uh, each visitor's stay? Or rather, it's five-minute intervals, uh, like for all the visitors in each five-minute interval, because we're running... Uh, the GET request to the API every five minutes. And that way we can uh, essentially get, uh, if we put five minute uh, intervals between the GET request, we can say, okay, here are between 6.30 and 6.35, there were 20 people 
that uh, entered uh, our parallel pool. Uh, if we just know how long on average these people would stay in the pool before leaving, we could essentially uh, put together a data set that says, okay, here's an approximation of how many people are at our parallel at the moment. Uh, the big idea is that we request historical data through the Icelandic vendor. And I, like I said, uh, and, but maybe it wasn't clear, so I'll reiterate, Lödelslög uh, has in and out data. Well, it's not perfect, it's just that the other five uh, swimming pools only have in data. Uh, and if two assumptions hold that uh, people's stays uh, are not inherently different in duration between Lödelslög and the other pools, and the second assumption that people stays are not inherently different in duration between people who are counted out and people who are not counted out of Lödelslög, which we figured out is essentially the problem. So, like the real kicker is that some people are counted out of Lödelslög, but not all. But if these assumptions hold and we get the historical data, we figure we can train a model on historical Lödelslög state durations of the people that are actually counted out and then predict durations onto the live API data for the other five pools. And that's what we did. And this is uh, essentially uh, like the sketchup of how we did that. So within uh, our Studio Connect, we have an R markdown document that is scheduled to run every five minutes. It gets the it gets the data from the live API, and uh, it also gets data from a pin. We use the pins package. Uh, it reads in uh, the in data that has essentially been read before. Okay, um, this is a terrible way to explain it, sorry. Okay, so essentially every five minutes we read the live data, but also every five minutes we check uh, for other, like the historical, uh, not, uh, not the historical data that we were hoping to get from the uh, vendor, but like every other API call. We've saved that to a pin, that we pin to the R Studio Connect board, and then we join those together. So we can then rewrite uh, over the pin. And uh, we then create a Shiny app, which read, reads like, let's say for today, if the Shiny app were to look at this in data, it would have an account of all, uh, like, all the, like, point in time counts for uh, every every pool. And uh, the Shiny app then takes uh, a, another pinned object, which is uh, a linear model, and then predicts when these people would leave. So you can present within the Shiny app an estimate of how many people are there. Uh, and just to go into the like what we essentially did. We started just on a local machine. And once we've got uh, access to historical data from the vendor, which they uh, save on Google Cloud, we read that data from BigQuery using the big R query package, but now we've uh, used, uh, now we use the R Studio professional drivers and the DPI package. We fit linear model for the, uh, predicting uh, the duration and the predictors are is it a weekend uh, how like how long since the summer solstice or how long until the summer solstice and then uh, we have a natural spline term of hours and we use uh, a sev uh, seven knots for the spline term uh, and it's we toyed around with it, but essentially we based uh, the like the number of knots on just staff knowledge. So it's we're saying it's different 
the, the duration is influenced by, of course, what time of day it is. And we've fit the knots for the spline at these points in time because they say, okay, it's different between uh, 6.30 and 9. So put a knot between, uh, put a knot at 6.30 and another knot at 9. And then they say, but also during the, during lunch hours, people stay like a much shorter time because these are people that have maybe 45 minutes or, or an hour for lunch if they're very lucky and they run to the swimming pool to, you know, get a swim in. And these people stay for a short time. So the, essentially, the, it's appropriate to fit a knot uh, around the uh, lunchtime and so on. So it's, this is not something that we like uh, were, we didn't have like uh, some fitting where it was, you know, decided by an algorithm. We just talk to people, does this make sense? And then we evaluate the different combinations uh, of knots on the training set. So, like I said, the R markdown document is scheduled uh, to read the data from the API, clean that data, and wrangle it into a table. Also, read data from the in dataset pin, and then append the cleaned API data table to the in dataset, and then pin that uh, updated in dataset to the R Studio board which is what I was trying to show here. So we have then a shiny application that just reads the in dataset pin, reads the model pin, which we have deployed to uh, RStudio Connect from our, we trained it on our local machine, but we deploy it to RStudio Connect. And then we run a predict function for that to create an estimate of current visitors. So this is uh, an example of that. This is data from September. And uh, this is rather reasonable uh, for the five pools that we are focusing on. But uh, uh is still not good. And uh, we essentially, we try to do some things which I'm not going to go into here. We tried another linear model to correct Lotus leg it didn't work out and the way we found out that it didn't work out was we essentially uh, gave this app to the managers of the swimming pools to evaluate and they said these five pools they're they're okay they're actually like they were really happy with it but Lotus leg it wasn't even close so that's something we have to uh, we, we still have to figure out but uh, like, why is this a cool thing? Because in my opinion, it's super cool because it's all R and R Studio Connect. So, the, like, we are an R shop here at the data science team. And if it's all R, we can move at our own pace. And for this part of the project, there were no outside constraints or, you know, inefficiencies in how we communicate with other groups. And we also get to run into the problems ourselves. Uh, and then we know what to take into account if parts of the process are outsourced beyond the team. And we've actually had this, like, a, a way to explain it is to think about, uh, like, building a car. And I've told Rachel this before. Uh, essentially, we're thinking about uh, if we are trying to build a car, there are many components that need to be built. And essentially, we are saying we can put up a fast prototype and do everything ourselves. Uh, and that way, we, there's, there's no chance of us running into a problem if we outsource to another team. Let's say you take this part of the project. Let's say in the example of a car, you create the, like the seats for the car. And then we get that back and we realize, okay, this didn't fit, they need to talk to us. But if we just do this ourselves, we run into that problem ourselves. And when we've built like a, a rather, you know, crummy version of the car uh, as like a, like a minimum viable product, 
we can then say, okay, we need to outsource this thing. We need to follow protocols regard, with regards to reading the API. And then we outsource that to our IT team. But then we can say, here's what we ran into and here's what you need to take into account. And that way we get results so much faster. So this is our current setup. So we are not actually reading from the API uh, using our Studio Connect. Now we it's put into web methods, where which is an integration platform which our IT team uses. So that's uh, it's just uh, protocol, and it's it's a, like super convenient for us because it gets written to uh, our Azure Data Lake storage, and uh, or rather the in data that is uh, created every five minutes that gets written to Azure Data Lake, and we can then read that in our our Markdown document every five minutes, and then we do a prediction. Uh, based on the linear model, which is still just a pin on our Studio Connect, because there's like no need to complicate that. And then we have a prediction table, which is what the Shiny app reads uh, on, like when you fire up the Shiny app, you're just reading from one uh, one table, which is the uh, like the prediction table, which is a pin on our Studio Connect, uh, a board on our Studio Connect. But just before we finish up. Uh, I want to talk about Leutherflake because that's like a, uh, that's a super interesting problem. Uh, and like I say here, the data for Leutherflake is absolutely whack. And uh, like you see, it's a technical term. And that has everything to do with how nice the staff at Leutherflake are. So like I said, it's the only, uh, it's the only pool that uh, counts in and out. But uh, when there are, say, school kids who go to their mandatory swimming, uh, like let's say there's a row or, or a queue of 40 school kids trying to leave the swimming pool after the swimming classes, uh, the staff at Lodeslo is not going to require everybody to uh, take their like their armband and bracelet rather and uh, put it into the machine, which then counts it. Okay, this individual came in you know, 90 minutes earlier, they're leaving now. They just open the, like, open the gates and the kids throw these uh, bracelets into a, like, into a bucket by the, by the entrance, essentially. And it also has to do with, like, at late at night when it's, there's a lot to do. They don't make people actually uh, wait for, you know, wait their time in the queue. So it's uh, all due to kindness. And I, you can read that phrase, damn you kindness, you ruined my data in the voice of the British comedian, comedian Richard A. Caster. You can, you can do that to yourselves. But uh, so the things we're trying, uh, of course, the, the first thing we wanted to do was just ask the vendor to make changes to the API, to separate the in data from the out data for Lotusleg. We're still waiting on this, but in the meantime, we have, you know, because we really want to do the, we really want to get this thing out. We've been working on it for a long time. So uh, one idea was to use a secondary, uh, like a, a, another counter that is located by the actual pools in Lodoslo, not by the entrance. But this has proven unfruitful because it's just a traffic counter. It doesn't say that people are going in this direction or in this direction. So it's just we can't tell you how many people are going into the pool and how many people are going out of the pool. And then this is like, pardon, pardon my English or rather pardon my French for what I'm about to say, but this, like the next thing feels like something you'd read on the twi uh, Twitter account, internet of shit, which is like an internet of things, like uh, it, where it roasts these smart solutions. Uh, but there are smart lockers in Lodersleg but like the internet of shit part is where it's unclear if the firmware can be updated to the most recent version to support live data. So uh, for the time being, we only have historical data for the smart lockers, which I believe gets read into a database uh, every night when the pools are closed. So this, uh, so essentially we tried a couple of things that didn't work. We're waiting on the vendor to make changes to the API and I'm sure it's, 
it's going to be, you know, oh, uh, let our lawyers talk to you, our lawyers, about this fee. It'll end up some, I'm jaded, I'm terribly sorry. Uh, but also, before I end, like this here was a gross oversimplification where we're only talking to uh, like the Icelandic partner to the vendor. Uh, there are also gyms that uh, uh, have access to the pools. So there, are, so you can go to a gym that's like located next to a pool and they have separate counters into the pool. So after you've done your workout at the gym, you can actually walk through some tunnel into the pool area. And uh, we have yet to uh, figure out how to count those because that's we deal with the Department of Sports and Leisure and Department of Sports and Leisure deals with the owners of the gym and the owners of a gym uh, talk to some Icelandic partner to a vendor which talk to uh, you know an international vendor. So it's like a more complex uh, like pipeline essentially pipeline of information. So still to do, uh, we need to account for like gym patrons that use the swimming pools at Lödelslög and Bredholtslög and like the final point of this presentation is of course there's going to be something else but we don't know it yet so i'd love to take questions on this i'm sure i yeah we have 20 minutes and i'm sure there are some things that i did not explain properly so i'm all ears thank you so much leonard that was awesome and i'm just thinking it's lunchtime here it would be so cool to be able to just go to a pool right now during <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of great questions that came in on Slido. Um, okay. And so just so everyone knows, and Josiah can help me share the link again, um, you can ask questions there. If you want to put your name in, I could also call on you to like add additional context too. But I'll start with some of the anonymous ones. Um, and one was, and quite a few people commented that they really liked that first visualization you shared. Um, and they said, could you kindly share the R syntax of the first visualization that showed your email tracking the day we requested, yeah. the day we received? Okay, yeah, so this is, uh, this presentation is like uh, an R marketing presentation. So the timeline, it's essentially three ggplot graphs. And I can share this, uh, I, sh I should have added my GitHub account, but I'll share this. Like this is this. Oh, I, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm not sharing the screen. I'm sharing the. I'm sharing the Chrome browser. Let me I can see the that. presentation screen. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the secondary screen so I can like uh, where's the share screen? Okay, hopefully. And I can share Hopefully your you can see my code with the recording. Oh, now I can see the code. Okay. Okay, so this is like this is just the data, and it's a like this is the first ggplot, and it's you know just a mess. But I didn't think I'd be sharing this code, but I'd be happy to, like uh, data realism. So yeah, I'll put that on my GitHub, and Rachel, you can perhaps share that. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. Um, someone else asked, is there a live link to the swimming pool dashboard currently? Uh, not that is accessible outside like the city of Reykjavik team, because we haven't, because of our problems with Lötersleg, uh, the, currently there are two apps. Uh, one app is for uh, the managers of the swimming pools, and the other one is like the in progress, because I hand, like I make the the plain looking shiny app, but then we have uh, Thor, who's a data scientist, a great data scientist here at the city of Reykjavik, who has like this artistic guy, and he makes like all the pretty production shiny app. So that one is hopefully, you know, soon to be released, but at the moment, uh, no, it's not accessible. Thank you. Um, and also if people have questions you want to ask live as well. I'm just going to allow people to unmute themselves too. And if you want to raise your hand, you can jump in too. Um, but I will go to the next anonymous question unless anyone has one you want to ask live. 
Okay. Um, one is, did this project initiate any improvements in user tracking um, or is everybody just content with the way you patch the problem and things will stay the same? I think you maybe mentioned at the end about the API possibly changing. Yeah, but uh, an another thing is that like there ha have been like uh, discussions between sports and leisure and the managers of the actual swimming pools with regards to change uh, like it's perfectly ac acceptable for 40, 40 school children to not be counted out but uh, like for the later like uh, if there's two full grown adults waiting in queue like you can they are essentially saying you, you know we'd appreciate if you stop the kindness just a little bit and you know let these people be counted out so that's uh, something that we haven't seen in the data yet but uh, provided that uh, yeah, provided that we fix things uh, with uh, like once we get the gym data and then we can say like can we look at this if if they were to like be more or, or rather less kind let's just say less kind now they count people out thank you i i love when you talk about like the people behind the data and thinking about like who those actual individuals are and what they're doing as they go about their day yeah um another upvoted question was could you compare your use of plotly and G giraffe, am I, am I pronouncing that package correctly? Um, did you use both yeah. or prefer one over the other? I actually, I started out using Plotly because I've been using that for a long time. But then uh, Thor, who's uh, this, uh, you know, artistic data scientist that I mentioned earlier, he uh, pointed me in the direction of G giraffe and I'd much, I much prefer that now it, because like, you just create a, a ggplot and then you wrap it in the ggraph and it's it's instantly becomes uh, uh, like an interactive visualization provided you change the like the geom part so it's it's i like the ggplot like flow to things and this is like a perfect extension to that cool thank you i'd love to hear from other people too, so you don't have to just keep hearing my voice. Um, <laughs> if you wanna ask questions live. Um, I see uh, Gregory or Gregor, you have a question. Yes. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Lena, for the great presentation. Actually, I, I'm an economist too, so that's, that's okay. nice to know that I'm not the only one interested in data science. And I wanted to know how much the, um, the city or the, the public entity is interested in all of what you can provide as data analyst or economist or, I mean, are there many projects that are willing to put you in or it's like still growing as you mentioned because it's, uh, it's new to them? Awesome question. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's actually just like skyrocketing. So like I said, okay. the data team is relatively new uh, at like years end 2019. But, uh, but now like uh, at, at the beginning there were, we didn't have these like fixed protocols in place, how we did these uh, projects. But now just with a little experience, we've been like moved into the IT, uh, uh, IT department's framework for like this is the way we accept projects and this is how we allocate time to them and like since that it's uh, it's become like made it's been made clear to uh, the departments within the city of Reykjavik like here is a team of data scientists if you have uh, an interesting use case or something urgent which uh, you want them to do here's how we would go about getting them in and it's like people are super interested in uh, doing that and it has to do with like you do you do one cool thing for like uh, the department of schools and the next and after that they're like okay we like 
they of course know like the potential, but then when when you hand something off to them, they see okay, this is something that's like this is something that's now available. It's like real essentially. So yeah, like super super interested in uh, all things data currently. Okay, very cool, very cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jai Wan, I see you asked a question on Slido and, and put your name there. Can I pass the mic over to you to add some context there? Yeah, sure. Um, just wanted to know how the teamwork or delegation works within your team. Do you face any limitations because you're in the public space? Uh, yeah, just wondering how the teamwork delegation works. Uh, yeah, okay, great question. Like like I said, we're, there's only six of us. So uh, we have our like uh, chief data officer, Inka, uh, and she's like the head of the operation, but we have uh, a data engineer and uh, we have me, a data scientist, and my uh, my skill set is mostly geared towards uh, predictive modeling, but also you know a analytics, you know, reports something that needs to be done. And then we have Sorpiot, who's uh, he's uh, like a super machine learning engineer type of data scientist. He's like so competent at that, but he's also like this. Uh, he's our go-to guy to like finalize the uh, you know shiny apps and do uh, like these more complex data visualizations map stuff and things like that and then we have uh, Siri who's uh, also a data scientist and she is uh, she is uh, like doing more of the report things um, currently uh, as our like our junior scientist, uh, and then we have Grimer, who's also a data engineer. So we have essentially three uh, data scientists, two en uh, engineers, and a chief data officer. Uh, and uh, the tasks that uh, Palle uh, and Grimer, the data engineers, they are split uh, more along the lines of like which uh, departments the data comes from. It's a rather complex conversation, but uh, like the between the science, uh, data scientists, uh, it's more like uh, focused on like what we're good at. Like Siri is uh, really good at not just, you know, shiny applications that are like doing reports, but like other things like Power BI and uh, ClickSense and stuff like that. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So so if I see you have your hand raised as well, can I pass it over to you? Uh, thank you, Rachel, um, uh, for giving me the chance. Um, and my apologies if I, I, I might have missed this um, right in the beginning. What I'm wondering is, uh, it's a quite an interesting project, but uh, the thing that I'm curious about is that what was the... Um, What's the problem that you're trying to solve with this project? Yeah. And what was the business case for this? If there is a strong business case for it. Yeah. So I didn't show the, yeah. Did, 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 did I show this slide? I'm not sure if I, sh if I showed this, this slide. So uh, it's, 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 it's essentially uh, like the first, the, the first thing that like sparked this idea was just, citizens uh, trying to figure out which pools were crowded and sending, you know, calling into the city offices. Is there a way to show us which can I, you know, can I tell if Lerotoslö is super crowded right now? And it, it's just this interest which started the conversation. But then once we, you know, that idea is sparked, uh, I've also talked to welfare workers within the city of Reykjavik and they are like, essentially because uh, if they have clients that have like uh, are susceptible to sensory overload load, they usually go to like really remote uh, swimming pools like in the edge of the suburbs like Kleberkslag which is not one of the pools in questions here but essentially just just to make sure that they are at a non crowded pool and then uh, like covid came and that's when the project actually 
uh, you know, became an actual project. Although we like we don't have 50% cap capacity now. It was only for like uh, two one month periods, but that's when there were actually like lines outside the swimming pools. And the idea was if we can get this, you know, up and running fast enough, we can then show people, okay, this this uh, pool is currently too crowded for you to go there, but here's a pool that is actually like not crowded. But sadly, or not, not sadly, like it's great that we don't have these uh, limitations anymore, but like we, we did manage to do it within that, you know, two month period. Yes, so I, think, I guess going forward, and now that, that explains a lot actually. Uh, thank you. I think I've seen something similar in terms of uh, people trying to check uh, how the crowded the supermarkets are. So yeah, yeah. Uh, going forward, if you could probably link it with the booking system for the swimming pool, then you might end up with a really nice yeah. uh, business backing for that. So no, it's a great yeah, project. And, thank you. Thank you so much. And like that, that's that's like uh, a five-year five-year plan. But it's the thing well, is, you, like, you it's, already have everything, you know. <laughs> so you, you but, could but, possibly like, do it in a couple of months' time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But like the booking system is is uh, connected uh, to the, so you can actually, if we were to you know team up with IT, we could actually uh, join forces. And within this app, you could not only see which pools are like, which pools are crowded and not crowded. You could actually like buy a ticket. Yes. So yeah, awesome. awesome. Thank you. Thank you. The Oli has. Uh, his hand is raised as well, and then I'll go over to some of the other anonymous questions. Hey, Oli. Hi, Leonard. What is it? Hi, Oli. You guys again. And I'd like to add also that the city of Reykjavik is on this digital transformation journey. And so the requirements are also coming straight from the business. So that we have these digital leaders scattered around the business. And they know their stuff and they come, come to the data team and the Department of Innovation and Services with projects that they have prioritized based on, you know, their operational needs. But, you know, I'm here for a question now, Lenny, and, and <laughs> we, you know, we're really close friends. Uh, since yeah. we're Icelandic, like everybody knows everybody here, there are like five of, us, five of us here in Iceland. So I, should, I should add that Oli is our fo former uh, chief data officer, which you know created this team of adventures, as I saw someone call it in the chat. Yeah, <laughs> and you you certainly are. But uh, you you um, I'm allowed one difficult question, but uh, I'm not. Okay. Gonna... <laughs> but I'm wondering. Will not a... answer it. No. <laughs> I'm, I want to have a discussion on like, I think this is super interesting for the people who are joining this call is, so, so we're building this prediction model for, for predicting how many people are visiting the pools. Um, what's the level of accuracy that is needed for that in terms of like value for the business, for the, for the pool business? So, yeah. Could you could you enlighten us on that? Because we have we've had yeah. this discussion so often, but I'm gonna <laughs> because I feel that it's super important for data science projects. Yeah. Are you is it valuable to predict whether there are 50 visitors or 51? It, like is there, yeah. is there a difference? Does this change something for me? But isn't the value like predicting whether there are 50 or 500? And exactly. I think yeah, actually case for talking about prediction accuracy in terms of value. Take it away. Yeah. Thank you, Oli. So uh, uh, the thing we did, like we we evaluated these models on training data, but we don't have test data because we're not going to ask the uh, staff there to you know count every five minutes and create a, a test data set for us. But rather what we did was uh, uh, leave it up to the managers and the staff of the swimming pools to look at the app and essentially they would be like the gauge if this is accurate enough for them. And the thing is they like one case where uh, they were doing like these daily spot checks. Okay, it's 2 p.m. You walk around the swimming pool and tell me how many people there are. And we can then compare that to, the, uh, to this app that this data science team has given us. And what they found out was 
like it was like in like well within their like margin of reasonable accuracy because it like Ole alluded to it doesn't matter if there are 70 or 75 people at the swimming pool but it does matter if it's 75 or 200 people so like one example was like we did the spot check it was 72 but the model uh, showed 76 we're completely fine with that and uh, you know so that essentially like uh, and this is what made it fun because as Ole knows uh, at my last place of employment I was like always, uh, you know, doing these increasingly complex uh, machine learning algorithms just to get like, you know, 0.07% accuracy increases. And that's like, that's not the fun stuff. But like the fun stuff is, you know, doing a project, uh, like a complete project and saying, okay, here's like this, uh, here's our estimate and we're not trying to, you know, was it uh, squeeze blood out of a stone? I'm not sure if that's even an English expression. It is an Icelandic. So, uh, so it's, yeah, it's fun. It's all I'm going to say, like working on a project that it's, it doesn't matter if it's 72 or 76, it's just well within so the about, margin of error. It's all about bringing the like correct level of accuracy for value, the value for the business. Yeah. Uh, like you mentioned in the, in the, in the talk, and I really like that, is like we evaluate our models through discussions with with our stakeholders. And I thought that was cool. Mm. And it was an awesome presentation, Linus. Thank you. You are awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Oli. You're awesome, Oli. Good to see you again. Thank you so much. Um, so a few other anonymous questions um, in here, if it's okay if we go over a little bit. Or do you have to run? Fine with me, fine with okay. me. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. And for anybody who missed it, I'll share the recording as well so they can uh, get the, their answers too. Um, but one was, what was it hard to set up the Azure or AWS, whichever cloud provider you used, with RStudio Connect and scale it up for production? So like uh, if it's regards to setting up RStudio Connect on Azure, uh, that's like that's beyond my comprehension. That's something that uh, the data engineers did. But getting our Studio Connect to talk to uh, our Azure Data Lake, uh, like storage container, is super easy. And it's it's the same for just you know doing it on your uh, essentially local machine. So that's been something that's been kind of a surprise. In that I can I can use the pins package, so I I can set up. A pin board on our studio, our studio Connect, and I can set up another pin board on uh, Azure Data Lake, so I can then use like the same pin underscore get function to get data from the uh, Data Lake and data from our Studio Connect. But the way we event, uh, eventually ended up doing it was using a package called Azure Store from uh, Microsoft employees, an open source package just on CRAN. And that's uh, essentially how we read the data currently into uh, into our Studio Connect. Just you know, there's a couple of it's like it's not a one-liner, but like uh, pin get, but maybe three or four lines of code. So it's been really, really nice. And and uh, sorry, and the key to that is like uh, setting the environment variables in our Studio Connect, so you don't store any like credentials in your code. Thank you, Leonard. Um, a few, all right, let's see. There's quite a few other questions still here. What package okay. do you use for the model? So this is like a super simple, uh, like linear splines model. So essentially the only packages we use for the modeling are just, you know, is, is util. No, it's probably stats that has the LM function and then uh, the splines package, which has the natural splines function. But then we used uh, Yardstick from Titan Models uh, to just uh, do the evaluations of, uh, uh, of accuracy on the training data. Awesome, thank you. Um, is there a way to manually remove the in data for, wow, and someone's gonna make me pronounce this pool, Lorgerslerg <laughs> in R? <laughs> 
so sorry, is there a way to is there a way to manually remove the in data? Um, if anyone I know it was anonymous, but if anyone wants to add any other context, feel free to jump in too. So it's like I, I think I understand the question. And the problem is that we we can't do it because what we see is like the difference uh, between five minute intervals. So uh, essentially if if minus two people are recorded as the change uh, between let's say 6.30 and 6.35, we, we have no idea looking at the data to tell if that minus two is because, you know, nobody uh, entered the pool but two people left or if like 10 people entered the pool and 12 people left. So sadly, uh, the data doesn't allow us to do that. Thank you. Um, could you let us know what other data science projects you currently are working on or have planned other than the swimming pool and, and COVID dashboard? So one of the things is uh, estimating like the need uh, for personnel at our call center. That's something that's uh, that we're working on, although it's not a priority priority currently, but uh, there are like in-depth reports regarding uh, just uh, not like a COVID dashboard, but you know the uh, economic uh, variables regarding you know the effect of COVID. We have that. Uh, it's both a report, and we've done uh, like a dashboard for that. Uh, but essentially, like uh, like this forty-page uh, R Markdown document that we update. Uh, and then hand into uh, like city hall essentially, and there are we did this deep dive into uh, like the costs of uh, essentially just um, I don't know what the English term for it is, but essentially like uh, if I, uh, if there are any special needs uh, in you know school districts. And it was essentially uh, a deep dive into uh, looking if there were unintended, uh, essentially biases, if if some uh, groups of students were uh, being uh, getting more uh, financing of special needs than others, and stuff like that. So it's it's all kinds of things. Um, thank you. Um, a great question here for others on the call who maybe are going through the very beginning stages of, of this process. Um, how did you get administration to buy into our Studio Connect? Um, and how did you get around data protection issues? So, like, this has a lot to do with Ole, who you saw earlier. He's now like uh, a suit and tie type of guy running things and, you know, as a manager. But uh, I think like the key thing is that he's like uh, a PhD in statistics and has been using R since 2006. So he understood uh, the importance of allowing people with specialized skill sets to like use the tools that are most suited for them. So he wasn't going to say, okay, but here's this other solution that, you know, we can save a couple of bucks on, but, you know, you're, you'll be out of your element. And I think it's just not every place is going to have uh, like uh, somebody that moved, uh, moved upwards from being a data scientist into the management role and then can influence decisions like that. But I think I think it has to, a lot to do with just communicating. Like you hired us because we have these particular skill sets, uh, and we're not like it's like this thing where you know somebody somebody is an R programmer, but then they come to this new place and they say, "Oh, uh, like can't you do this in Python?" And then they have to like become this subpower Python program instead of using their superpower of, you know, having worked in R. 
for like the last 10 years or whatever. I, um, I just remembered I forgot to make an announcement earlier and I apologize for that to the Lander Analytics team, but I did want to let everyone know that there's also an R in government uh, conference coming up soon. So I wanted to say that before a few other people have to, to run. Um, and there, the Lander Analytics team is actually so kind to provide us a 20% promo code for anybody who attended the meetup. Um, so I'm going to share that on the meetup page as well. Um, but the conference is on December 9th and 10th. Um, so I'll, sh I'll share the link in the chat window too, if, if anyone wants to check it out. But it seemed like it would align very well with um, the meetup today and, and for a bunch of people who are in the, the government space. But if anyone from Lander Analytics is on and you want to jump in and provide any more info, feel free to, to do so too. And my bad for not saying that earlier. I'll share the link in, in just a second. Um, Leonard, there's two other questions left. And I know you touched upon this one a little bit, but um, it was for this project, what profiles were involved into constructing all this? Um, not only the data science team, but stakeholders and technical team. Oh, okay, yeah. So, uh... The profiles meaning I'm sorry it, it, I think I think um, they mean so like or I'm, a, I'm assuming so feel free to jump in I know it was anonymous but thinking about this um, project specifically and getting that from from zero to into production um, who were the stakeholders that you had to work with and who are the technical teams that you had to work with to get that done as well okay okay Awesome, thank you. Uh, I'm showing you what a mess. No, I'm not sharing the screen. Okay, thankfully. I, so uh, the the two big ones were uh, like uh, at the Department of Sports and Leisure. There are like uh, there are it's like a like a mini IT department, and uh, we essentially report to them, but they also help us with communicating to you know, vendors and partners of vendors. But then uh, within the Department of IT, we also had to, uh, we needed to move the API requests to the, like the centralized integration platform. So there is a, a special, uh, it's called web methods, this integration platform. So we had to uh, essentially deal with them, but the, 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 they are, Perhaps not, perhaps not stakeholders essentially, but like comrades. Uh, but I think like the, the two largest stakeholders are essentially the I, this like mini IT team at the Department of Sports and Leisure and the managers of the swimming pools because there is a, a manager of each swimming pool because these are like rather large establishments. And uh, I th because essentially we are hoping to uh, make their lives uh, somewhat easier. Also, the staff at the uh, swimming pools, because like provided this goes as planned and people actually start to look where it's crowded, you know, it's hopefully going to be more distributed across all the pools. I'm not sure if that answered anything really, but <laughs> it was my attempt at that. I thought it was helpful to me, but feel free to unmute yourself if you have any follow-up questions on that too. One of these days we'll all be in person and we'll feel more comfortable all like talking as a yeah. <laughs> group, maybe at a, our studio conference one day, we'll have these birds of a feather groups again. Um, the other question is, how did you communicate the need for staff hours for future projects? Um, so for example, with only six people right now and this interest in data projects growing, um, will you need to kind of advocate for, for more data scientists? 
this is like uh, this is kind of you know uh, the secret sauce of this project is that it uh, because it was agreed to before like the workflow was finalized with regards to allocating you know the resources of the data scientists. Uh, this has been kind of you know it's been it it wasn't put in a box essentially it wasn't there wasn't some uh, these are the man hours that are allowed to and it, it and it's not like but of course that that's also part of the shortcomings of this project because if it had been uh, you know put in a box and just uh, scoped as a, a project like we do now now that we've moved into that phase of our operation it we, we probably would have like ran into these uh, like speed bumps much earlier uh, instead of just uh, you know accepting the project as is and diving into it and then it kind of becoming a side project because you know because it is a rather weird project I'll jump onto it when I have nothing else to do and you know when, when when there's like, oh, you can get this data, or you can get this connection, or like from the gyms and stuff like that, I can, you know, I can kind of treat that as a side project with, uh, sorry, with less oversight than uh, like the regular project. But at the same time, we like if we had put this into the formalized process and scoped it, I'm sure we would have like because now it's been like okay here's the problem we ran into let's talk to the department of sport and leisure and they'll, they'll go oh why don't you use like the secondary counter let's try that and we go oh we didn't know there was a secondary counter nobody had told us that and when that doesn't work like oh why don't you why don't you try the like the smart uh you know locks in the in load of and we're like oh nobody nobody told us that there were smart locks so it's been like a blessing and a curse that this it's been kind of like a rather unofficial project, so to speak. Thank you, Leonard. And just you mentioning that, like these side projects was making me think about something which I think is really cool that your team does on Fridays, where you have like the chance to work on like anything that you want to. And was curious if you could just tell us all a little bit more about that too. I, like I'm the least like you'll get the least interesting answer out of me because you know <laughs> uh, it's gonna be this project. <laughs> so, but uh, like uh, just to name uh, so Thor, our our data scientist, he's uh, he's he's been like focusing on uh, getting up to speed with D three and you know uh, taking graphs that are you know based on data in R and then uh, putting that into like uh, a JavaScript uh, to create a D3 plot, which is something that he's passionate about. And uh, uh, and it's gonna be like a super nice thing for us moving forward. Awesome. I also know that the team's, part of the team's mission or information you had shared with me probably a year back was that you wanna hopefully be able to like help other cities do something similar and kind of create maybe a working group among other people using R and public sector, different data science teams. And I just wanted to open up the conversation about that if, if anybody wants to, to jump in to really just see like what would be the best way for us to all start to do that and be able to network with each other and share best practices. Um, I think the meetups are great for being able to like highlight different use cases and ask questions. Um, but I'm thinking like on a go going forward basis, is that some kind of like Slack channel or a LinkedIn group? What would be helpful to you all or what ideas do you have? Yeah, just to like before, is anybody, I can't see if anybody's raising their hands. Not yet. <laughs> it, it seems like, like uh, some of that is going on in LinkedIn groups now, which I, I didn't think was, uh, it didn't seem like, like a viable solution to me some months ago, but a lot of things are moving in that direction. Man, I see Manju just recommended that as well. Um, maybe we could start with testing that out too. And just for people who joined this event, 
as well and to invite other people going forward. Does anyone else have any other ideas for how to do that or how to better connect people? Great. Do I want, that's a great point as well. There's also the, um, I find the Slack channels on the R for data science online learning community really helpful too. Um, and so I will ask John who moderates that if we could create um, like a government channel as well. Yeah, that'd be really, really cool. And that's, um, if anybody's not in that Slack channel, you can always just join it by going and I'll put the, I'll put the link in the chat window, but it's just r4ds.io slash join. I see someone had unmuted if you have anything else to add to. Yes, um, I also, oh, nice to meet you. Thanks for your presentation today. And uh, yeah, because I'm kind of like old school, but I think I prefer also face-to-face -face communication, meeting, meeting the person who's working in that field and have this experience asking the question directly. But those kind of art conference, maybe we can have after this COVID disappeared. I'm not sure it's gonna disappear, but after it gets better, because um, one of the things that you posted, the art conference, which is pretty expensive. And yeah, it's, it's to me, oh, should, should it be worth it or not? Because some $100, more than $100. So I think they, it's better for us to have some kind of um, opportunity meeting um, people in the field and, and sharing the opinions of it. Definitely. And hopefully we all will be able to meet at conferences again soon as well. But I do think a really good thing that came out of the past two years as well with these virtual events is that like anybody can join and it's open to everyone and um, free of, of costs, obviously. But if I can ever help be like the middle person there introducing people or I'm also ha happy to do that. Um, so I'm a professional community manager here at our studio. That's my new title as of six months ago. Um, so always feel free to reach out to me directly to on LinkedIn or I'll put my email in the chat. Um, and I'd love to be able to help connect people. And maybe if that's a like virtual coffee where we have like smaller group chats as well to talk about specific challenges that you're facing or I don't know, something specific like shiny optimization. Um, happy to, to help set that up and organize it for people too. Um, I know we got into all the questions on Slido and we are definitely way over Linner. So th thank you so much for, for staying on and, and answering all the questions. I do wanna just do one last check to see if anybody else on has anything that you wanna ask or things you'd like to see or, or feedback as well. Be great to hear from you all. I just wanna say thank you so much, Linner, for an awesome presentation. It's so cool to be able to dive deeper Thanks into so the story as well. But I just wanted to say, okay, just if anybody wants to like talk on LinkedIn or whatever, like please add me and I'll, I'll you know, answer any questions and you know, learn from you and vice versa. So thanks everyone. Well, thank you so much, Slinner. Have a great rest of the day. Really appreciate it. Thank and, and thank you all so much for joining.